doctoral researcher at Vista Milk working on pasture breeding. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Jérôme Bondel from University of Liège. Uh, his work is focused on the link between nutrition and intestinal health in pigs and humans, but also on grazing management and decision support tools for farmers. Today, we will hear more about remote sensing of sword structure and biomass for precision grazing. Professor Bondel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Agneska. I will start sharing my screen so you can see my presentation. Mm -hmm. Let me just see if that's all right. So it's, it's everywhere, everything okay <clears throat> from your side? Everything is great. Thank yeah, you. okay, thank you, Agneska. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. So I'm Jérôme Bandel from the University of Liège in Belgium. And uh, on behalf of my co-authors, I would like to express my gratitude because I feel very honored for um, being invited by the organizers of this masterclass to to have the opportunity to share our views on these very interesting topics, which is artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence applied to something that is very dear to us, which is uh, grazing management and more specifically struct sword structure and uh, biomass. I also would like to uh, present my apologies for my voice today, because I am actually recovering from a flu that hit me in the past days. So I hope yeah, that you guys will understand me well, despite this. Um, this little problem that I have today. Um, I'm pretty sure that I'm pleading in front of a convinced audience uh, today, but still I cannot start my, my presentation uh, without a little reminder about the importance of grasslands covering significant areas in the world and being at the heart of the most criticized, but as well the most sensitive livestock, livestock farming systems. Um, so it is very important to manage them well, as we are all convinced, I suppose. Uh, as you know, field methods, and uh, Claire just before me um, showed some examples of that, field methods are really time consuming and almost since they appeared, remote sensing technologies um, have been seen as past, as, as have been seen by past scientists as alternatives to uh, provide interesting indicators for, uh, for management. So um, in this context, uh, the fast development of uh, satellite imagery, but also unmanned aerial systems, which we usually call drones, as you know, seem to enable, um, seem to enable them as possible tools for decision-making to support grazing management. So this is a possible way to uh, improve the way we can manage pastures. But to do that, we need really to integrate knowledge between different types of scientists. On the, on the one hand, we have pasture scientists, and on the other, we have remote sensing scientists, but also data scientists. Um, so we really need to build these bridges between expertise. And I think the need to build these bridges between different types of expertise is probably highlighted by what I, what I understand from the diversity of the audience that we have today in this uh, Vista Milk uh, Masterclass. So in the overview that I will be uh, presenting today, uh, if you are a pasture or, or an animal scientist, you will have maybe to wait for the second part of my presentation um, to learn some new stuff. But if you are more from the remote sensing science or from the data analysis, the first part might take you a little bit out of your comfort zone and you will have to wait for the part to be more in your comfort zone. But I hope that all of you will enjoy 100% of the presentation today. So um, I will start maybe with some uh, fundamental and that might be reminders to uh, most of you. Uh, so let me start with the definition of what grazing is. So grazing is defined as the action of an herbivore to feed on a growing herbage. So this looks like a pretty simple definition, but actually behind this definition hides hide very complex interactions between the plant and the animal. These can be seen as two separate compartments of the whole 
pastoral uh, ecosystem. And so the art of grazing management, and I call it an art on purpose, lies in making sure that uh, both the plant and the animal requirements are met when this event of grazing takes place. So, <coughs> excuse me, we will start with um, the perspective of the plant on, uh, on this grazing, uh, which can be seen, as you see on this image, um, as the sudden reduction um, for the plant in the above ground foliage. Thus, it, this implies a reduction in the capacity of the plant to capture sunlight for photosynthesis, because we all know that uh, leaves from those plants are made for that, right? So from the perspective of the plant, the management, the grazing management should be oriented towards controlling or maintaining, even after a defoliation, the ability of the plant to intercept light quite efficiently. So um, from a grazing management perspective, usual targets would recommend grazing to be initiated when the grass wart reaches something like a light interception of about 95%, uh, whether such targets are also, uh, whether um, tar uh, grazing target recommendations are set also for light interception after defoliation is another story. So usually we have targets before grazing, but we don't have that specific targets after defoliation. Um, among the different traits that will characterize the sword structure, so it's high, the leaf stem ratio, the ground cover, the bulk density, the leaf area index, which is uh, represented here on this image, uh, which means actually the total area of leaves per uh, unit of growth area, is actually very critical because this leaf area index is the one that has a positive relationship with the ability of the plant to intercept sunlight and thus to uh, provide energy for the plant, as we saw um, on the previous slide. So grazing management would require to measure LAE to make sure that LAI, excuse me, to make sure that uh, we can manage this ability of the plant to intercept sunlight. But actually in the field, it's very hard to do that. So it's not an easy task. So uh, usually uh, grazing management will require to measure other indicators that have an indirect relationship with, um, with um, LAI, with leaf area index. And so we will use other proxies that are more, that are easier to monitor from the plant perspective. Um, for example, flipping the vegetation and measuring biomass, as shown here on the left-hand side of the figure, might be such a method to make a connection, um, a relation, to establish a, a relationship between LAI and biomass. But this method is also time-consuming and it's destructive. So um, several um, non-destructive alternatives have been proposed to measure uh, these parameters of the vegetation, and they are more practical to use. For example, the very successful uh, rising plate meter, and I guess in Ireland, many farmers use this kind of equipment, which here it's a homemade um, uh, rising plate meter, but I'm sure that in Ireland, uh, you know, the ones that are connected to a GPS, so which allows you to uh, also have a location of the different measurements that you can make. So from this rising plate meter, you can uh, derive information on the, on the biomass that is available on your pasture. Then if we want to measure another parameter of, um, of the, um, the swarm, another uh, structural parameter would be the, the swarm height, which is measured uh, by a swarm stick. It's also a non-destructive uh, tool, and it also can be specialized by putting a GPS on such a, a swarm stick. But both the use of a swarm stick or a rising plate meter remain still a little bit Time consuming because you have to walk on your on your paddocks and measure the grass height, and it requires an operator to do that. Uh, and so it will take a very long time if you want to uh, to cover the whole area that uh, you um, you want to um, uh, to offer to your cows to graze. Um, capturing light is not the only factor for the for the plant. There's a whole balance between um, the production of new leaves the senescence of older leaves, the storage, the mobilization of uh, energy reserves. Um, and so assessing uh, grazing condition of a pasture is not only about how much biomass 
or what structure that that uh, to be great sword should have for the for the the plant but also how much you should leave after a grazing event because this will determine uh, for how long you will have to uh, ideally prevent these grass to be grazed if, so it, it is allowed to um, recover properly before experiencing a new uh, defoliation so saying that will um, take me to the second component of um, the grazing because um, it's the animal, so the perspective of uh, the animal. So from the perspective of the animal, grazing is a multi-scale process that involves a combination of uh, uh, one-time choices, which are very confined to the level of uh, a, an individual bite on a specific uh, feeding station, to larger movements uh, of the animals across a whole pattern. So animals that actually don't see the vegetation as a whole, but I, but we can well, we don't know how they see it, but we can assume that they rather see a vegetation as a multitude of uh, biting opportunities. Um, <laughs> so the key questions for the animals seem to be um, among these variety of bite opportunities, uh, which one should I choose? Which one would be the most interesting for me to take now, and which one should I took should I take uh, later on? And we think that the animal sees the, the grazing process uh, in this way, because when we look at grazing uh, animals, we see grazing herbivores, we see that the major limitation that they might, they, they might experience to fulfill the, their daily feed requirements um, um, for uh, our domestic animals, but also, I guess, for the grazing white rabbit from uh, Alice in Wonderland, as displayed here, is this uh, major limitation is usually set as the time that they have to collect their um, daily forage allowance through tens of thousands of uh, individual bites. So it really takes a lot of time for a grazing herbivore to collect the whole forage on the, on the paddock. So this process should be, from the animal perspective, as efficient as possible. And interestingly, uh, some recent works from um, from uh, our colleagues from uh, Brazil, from uh, Paulo Carvalho's group, showed that for each um, uh, grass species, we can um, there exist a, um, a smart height that helps the animal maximizing its short-term intake rate, as displayed here. So, if you plot uh, the changes in short-term intake rates um, of um, of grazing ruminants. Uh, for example, cattle, let's say cattle, against the pasture height measure as, uh, measured through a sword stick, you can see that you have usually a bell-shaped sh curve, and this uh, bell-shaped curve allows you to identify a point where the animal has the sword height that provides him with the best opportunity for, a short, for a maximizing the short-term intake rate. So there's an ideal structure that helps the animal uh, grazing the most efficiently uh, uh, that is possible for that animal, meaning that allows the animal to eat as much forage as possible in the smallest uh, uh, amount of time possible. Now let us think about this uh, question of uh, why is there a need to specialize information on the sword uh, structure and also on the sword uh, biomass? So uh, I read in a paper of uh, one of your colleagues, I guess, uh, Murphy and his colleagues, uh, that the coefficient or variation in the Irish uh, paddocks in terms of, I guess it was biomass, but maybe smart height, was as high as uh, 70%. So this means that across a paddock, you might have a high, you will have definitely a high variation in terms of the different attributes of that smart. So <clears throat> this actually originates from the fact that uh, grazed grasslands are, by essence, they are heterogeneous. Just because of the grazing, of course, this one is not a, uh, an Irish uh, pasture, it's the Pampa in Brazil, so it's highly heterogeneous, but it's just to illustrate my, my speech today. Uh, <laughs> and here, when I talk about heterogeneity, 
I'm talking about the, um, the heterogeneity in the sense of the spatial variability uh, of uh, grassland characteristics, for example, uh, the, the swan effect. So why are raised grassland necessarily heterogeneous? Because animals are selective. So they look for uh, specific plant species. They look when they have found a plant, plant species that they would like to eat, they will uh, choose on that plant species specific plant parts for a given species. And also they might look for a specific species also for specific plant structures that allow them to optimize uh, their uh, insect rates as discussed before, so in the previous slides. So um, this is one reason why uh, great grasslands will become heterogeneous because of the action of the animals. Moreover, um, if the animals, they will take one bite on one plant in a couple of seconds, it might take one or two seconds, no more, for the plant to recover from that bite, that will take several weeks or days or weeks. So um, what happens is that the herbivores can only graze a small portion of the whole grazable areas that they are offered to graze. Uh, and so this, the consequence of that is that when you put animals on a, on, a, on a pasture, they will turn the grazed pasture into a vegetation with patches of different regrowth stages. And so the structure will always be heterogeneous after uh, uh, when you put animals to graze on a pasture. And so we must we might ask ourselves if heterogeneity is always a bad thing. But interestingly, when you look at these simulations from uh, a work of Arthur uh, Pontes Pratis, <clears throat> we see that heterogeneity is not always a, a bad thing. So uh, in some conditions, it can enhance the functional response here, the integrate of the animals. Um, and minimize grazing time by these animals, as shown on this on this figure. And it works actually by providing the animals with better or more efficient grazing opportunities. So they, they are allowed to find on that pasture um, patches with the, uh, the, the right swan height that allows them to maximize their intake rate. So monitoring the vegetation at a high frequency, for example, with, uh, with a drone, has the potential not only to identify and keep targets uh, swan height, but also to address the question, the degree of heterogeneity. So we can talk here about swan height variation to, to make it simple and use this information for uh, management. So this will now take me to the second part of, uh, of uh, today's speech, which is uh, the idea of using now remote sensing to uh, monitor these grazing conditions that we discussed a little bit above. So, um, Remote sensing can be used um, for the characterization of vegetation in various contexts. So um, grassland has been tackled in various ways and we can dif differentiate according to uh, basically four factors. So which vegetation traits we want to, uh, to uh, identify uh, the sensors and I say sensors with an S that can be used the platform that is onboarding the, um, the sensors, and also the extension of the area to characterize um, the, um, uh, to, that we want to monitor, and also the grain factor. And I would, and I should add a fifth factor, and which is of uh, of your interest today, which would be the data processing method that can be used to um, to interpret the the remote sense. Uh, data that has been acquired and transform it into a usable information. But we will discuss about that a little bit later. So <laughs> in terms of, um, of platform, on one side of the gradients here on the right hand side, um, we have uh, satellite remote sensing that can have a global coverage uh, at a very low cost for the end user, because usually you don't have to pay to uh, to um, receive uh, the images, at least for some constellations. Some constellations are free, uh, free of use. Of course, you will need to pay to uh, process the data because there's always a cost somewhere. Um, the spatial resolution ranges from 10 to 30 meters for uh, these free of charge constellations, but you can have constellations with a, um, um, 
a narrower uh, spatial resolution. In terms of um, orbit periods, revisits, which meaning by the frequency by at which you can um, acquire new information on a specific paddock will be done every five to 10 days. Then you have uh, yeah, an in-between solution, which uh, would be airborne remote sensing. And finally, uh, the drones um, that could cover areas that are still relevant. There are smaller areas, of course, than satellite imagery, but they can cover areas that are still relevant from a grazing management perspective, meaning you know, in one single survey, they can cover areas as large as uh, 10 hectares. And they can also provide uh, very high spatial resolution data under 10 centimeters, which is actually highly relevant from a plant animal interface perspective, because then you get to the resolution of the of the bite as shown here on this um, on this figure. Um, also, revisit uh, of uh, a paddock by the, the remote sensing device can be done when you actually decide it as long as the uh, weather conditions uh, allow it, of course. So regarding the, the sensors, uh, there are several kinds of sensors that are or can be used. So you have the hyperspectral li LIDAR or radar data that are kind of uh, silver bullets. Uh, if you want to go to either spectral uh, characterization or build uh, three dimension models of the SWARD uh, structure. But many papers that I've gone through actually focus more on, uh, on more passive uh, sensors uh, using sometimes even off the shelf cameras as shown on the left hand side here on the, on the image. So um, uh, red, green, blue cameras, just like the ones uh, you used to have when you didn't have a cell phone to take pictures. Um, also near infrared multi uh, spectral cameras uh, are, are often used. So these sensors, um, they display very strong differences in terms of resolution costs and ease of use. Uh, for example, RGB cameras, they can have a very high spatial resolution, but they have a very lower quality in terms of spe spectral information. Hyperspectral cameras on the other side, they can see sense a large portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. They can range from uh, lower than 400 nanometers to over 1,500 uh, nan uh, nanometers, meaning to uh, UV uh, and uh, to uh, near from UVs to um, uh, near infrared uh, spectrum, with a very high uh, spectral resolution, resolution meaning that um, the the band overlap is very uh, very low. But they have a lower these hyperspectral cameras. They have a lower spatial resolution, and these multispectral cameras here in the middle, they're in the middle because they can be seen also as an in between uh, solution. So, <laughs> whatever the platform that you use. And whatever the sensor that you put on that platform, so whether it's a drone with multispectral camera or whether you're using satellite data with, uh, with uh, radar imagery, um, they will yield you with uh, raw data that you must then convert into uh, useful information. And uh, from a creating management perspective, I suppose that you have guessed what I consider as useful information. It's put here uh, below. So leaf area index, information on biomass, on grass height, and some people try even to go to um, grass quality um, as well. So uh, for this, we can disting distinguish between two major approaches. So um, the first one would be uh, to calculate or to, uh, yeah, to derive vegetation uh, indices. And so here, and the other one would be to try to derive uh, a 3D model of the vegetation surface, as a, which is uh, stated here as uh, point clouds. And then once you have that, you rasterize the data and you apply data processing methods that might be simple multiple regression or more sophisticated machine learning algorithms that you probably know better than I do because I'm actually not a data scientist, but more a passive scientist, as you might have guessed. So for those who are not familiar with uh, the concept, 
um, vegetation indices are actually combinations of uh, surface reflectance at two or sometimes more uh, wavelengths that can range from the UV, so below 380 nanometers to uh, the, the infrared, so above eight, uh, 850 nanometers of uh, wavelength. So these vegetation indices, they are, um, they are designed to highlight a specific property of the vegetation in one single value. So the most famous one that you probably all heard of already is um, the NDVI, which combines reflectance in the red, which is absorbed by an active vegetation, just to make photosynthesis, of course, and the near infrared, which is strongly reflected by this active vegetation, because otherwise that plant would just overheat and just burn. So um, this is one thing that is done with this spectral information. And then on the other side, on the other, um, on the other uh, side of the spectrum, we can have the, uh, the, um, the derivation of 3D model. So um, for example, imaging sensors, just like our, our RGB cameras can allow us to derive these 3D models by using specific um, uh, softwares that are based on uh, structure from motion uh, photogrammetry. And so the idea is, simply doing the same thing your brain does with two eyes that look at the same scenery. So it, it's the idea is to be the, the very uh, slightly different perspective from both of your eyes allows you to reconstruct the th uh, third dimension. So the depth of the, the image that you are looking at. And so by assembling several images with a strong overlap of the same paddock, you can uh, rebuild a 3D model of the uh, sword canopy. And so if you combine this to a 3D model of the ground level, uh, you can derive actually a digital sword height. So by making the difference between the ground, uh, um, the ground level model and the um, sword canopy level, you can have your actual sword height thanks to that. Uh, and this allows you to um, to derive this information at an unprecedented spatial resolution and also over areas beyond comparison with what you can do just going on the field with your SWAT stick, as you saw on the, one of the, um, the, the slides before. LiDAR or radar data, they can also provide you with such uh, 3D models. And um, one big advantage of LiDAR or radar data is that by changing the wavelength of the radiation, they can go through different um, at different depths within a vegetation. Okay, so they can provide you um, with uh, information on the the inner structure of uh, of the vegetation, and also the radiation, at least for radar, can be polarized. And so, by polarizing the radiation and seeing how this polarized radiation is reflected, you can also have uh, additional information on the surface that is reflecting the signal, so allow you to go deeper into, um, in further details into information, for example, on the uh, quality of the grass that is hit by this radiation. So, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the quality of uh, such 3D models is commonly evaluated through simple linear regression with a reference one height. So field reference is always used to evaluate the quality of such 3D models. So um, they can yield R squares of about 70% and sometimes even higher. So even when you use a low cost commercial drone sold for the general public, just like, like you can go in one of your stores, I don't know the stores in Ireland, <laughs> but um, I wouldn't say any store, I don't want to make commercials today, um, advertisement today. So um, let's say you go in any store, you buy an um, uh, off-the-shelf uh, drone that is usually used by the general public. With such drones, you can already reach very acceptable uh, resolutions. Uh, interestingly here, what you see here on this slide is that um, using the same database, we observed that the average SWAT height measured at the scale of plots was better predicted that points want hard uh, measurements 
And we ascribe this to um, the fact that there's an increased risk of discrepancy in the location between the reference point, which you need to very accurately um, locate on the field, and the model, <laughs> the model type. And of course, this discrepancy between the, the accurate location of the reference point is, um, is uh, reduced when you work at the paddock, uh, at the, the experimental plot or the paddock level. And looking at this uh, interesting work that was done by uh, Hiroyuki uh, Obanawa and his colleagues, uh, we can see that later point clouds really stand out in terms of quality of prediction of swan height with almost zero bias. Of course, the um, surface to motion uh, photogrammetry provides very decent results, but the LiDAR is, well, I would say, one step uh, higher than uh, this uh, surface to motion um, photogrammetry. So <laughs> drone images <laughs> can be used to model also other structural traits like sword biomass or uh, leaf area index, generally through the use of various modeling methods, which sometimes include machine learning. Uh, such modeling approaches usually um, integrate spectral information, okay, through vegetation indices. Uh, <clears throat> and you can also acquire these uh, vegetation indices by using um, specific uh, spectral information also from basic RGB sensors, although the resolution would be a bit lower because you have a higher band overlap when you use just RGB sensors to do uh, to um, calculate vegetation index. So here once again the performances that you show that you see here on this slide are quite quite decent, I would say. So you have R squares of about 70% for LAE or chlorophyll content, but some researchers, like uh, colleagues from Finland, they uh, they could reach for dry matter yields R squares of um, as high as 90, uh, 96%. So, <clears throat> so working with um, satellite images now, um, so working with satellite images for grazed pasture is actually much older than working uh, with drones for um, grazed pastures. Uh, and it has shown to be very useful. And I guess the oldest work that I found in the literature that uh, explained that that related some work on grass pasture with satellite imagery dates as dates back to 1982. I was born, <laughs> but I wasn't very old by then. So just to tell you um, that is that it's nothing new, I guess. And so, but what I'm going to show you today is uh, I want. I'm going to show you some pieces of work that we recently did using um, Sentinel data. This is why I took these images from the European Space Agency. So for those who are not familiar with Sentinel, I would consider myself as not very familiar with Sentinel as well. So um, I'm just putting you at the same page as I am. So <laughs> Sentinel-1 <clears throat> is a polar orbiting all weather day and night radar. Uh, sensor. So you have two satellites that orbit uh, around the Earth and that take images uh, with a revisit uh, frequency, I guess, of about five days. And then we have Sentinel-2, which is same kind of uh, mission, but uh, the sensors that is on the satellite is different. It's a multi-spectral sensor with 13 uh, type of bands. The, um, um, so we took these images from Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1, we've merged these um, images in a database with field observation of compressed swan heights. So these compressed swan heights are actually rising plate meter data that are um, geolocated. And we mix that as well with um, weather data here, it's here, the, uh, the weather data, and then we fed that to uh, machine learning algorithms and we asked them to predict and validate the field measurements from those Sentinel data corrected by the meteorological uh, data. Obviously, it's a bit more complicated than that, but the principle is there. So uh, in terms of satellite data, what did we use? 
So we use the C-band, the C-band radar data from Sentinel-1 here, okay, which is a specific uh, wavelength from these um, uh, radar images. And we used also uh, the, um, the 13 uh, spectral bands of Sentinel-2. We cleaned the database. So namely, you have to remove uh, the cloudy days, you have to apply atmospheric uh, condition uh, corrections, etc. And then you have to apply a grid to resample all the images at the same, uh, same size, which was uh, um, a pixel of 10 by 10 meters that we used uh, to resample the images and also to select um, the pixels for, for which we had information on uh, compressed swan heights on the field. And then we merge everything into one uh, single database um, with the meteorological data. We still had to, we still had to uh, tackle one issue is the fact that you actually don't know when you will have a visit of a Sentinel uh, satellite about the paddock that you're measuring on the field. So um, we had to uh, average where, because the average revisit frequency of uh, Sentinel-1 and 2 was about 10 days. So in theory, it's about every five days. But since you have cloudy days, and I guess you have even, even more cloudy days in Ireland than you have in Belgium, um, this is why Ireland is so green. Uh, so that's your luck, I would say. Um, so we, we, need, we had to apply a 10 days uh, time window, a 10 day time window to make sure that we could ascribe a field measurement to a specific uh, image from uh, Sentinel. And from the Sentinel data, we also applied several uh, transformation on the variables. So uh, square, log, cubic, exponential function, and we split the database in two. So one for the calibration and uh, one so for the training here and one for the validation. And then we threw everything in the mouth of uh, 142 machine learning algorithm. And from these algorithms, some performed really poorly, but others performed really well. And so four model uh, stood out with <laughs> uh, RMSE of, valid, of independent validation of less than two centimeters, uh, talking about the value of the uh, predicted compressed heart height uh, at the pixel level. So the 10 by 10 uh, meters uh, pixel. So it was one of these models was a cubist model. The other ones was a GLM net. Another was a neural network algorithm. And the last one was a uh, random forest based model. So these models allowed us to explore how we could use them uh, at the level of the whole Walloon region, which is um, the one region in the southern part of Belgium, which covers a bit more than half of the, the country. And so how we could use those models to develop decision support tools uh, for farmers. And it also allowed us to <clears throat> identify some key issues that still need needed to be dealt with before we could offer a decent service to the farmers using just these algorithms for prediction of compressed heart height. One of these issues is the revisit frequency of uh, about every 10 days. And sometimes also cloud cover can uh, result in not having uh, single images for more than one month on one, uh, one specific pattern. So one solution could be to extrapolate values from nearby pixels, or the other uh, solution could also be to combine this satellite imagery with mechanistic transplant modeling to provide, in any case, a prediction to the farmers uh, about the state of their, uh, their pastures. Another uh, key issue, and I guess Claire talked a little bit about that as well, at least from, um, I think she wanted to touch that a little bit, is the transferability of the prediction algorithm. So, um, and this whatever the sensor, so, um, the idea is to overcome the side dependencies. So um, the regression or the machine learning models that are really good and promising, but to be really useful in practice, they must be able to um, predict properly the values over fields that they have on which they haven't really been tested. 
And so, um, so they can be applied in a wider range of uh, conditions. For example, if I take this slide again, you can see that there's a temporal, there are temporal variations in the uh, ratio of photosynthetically active um, uh, biomass and the dead biomass uh, on, a, on a field or in a vegetation. And so this strongly impacts the quality of prediction equations that are derived from spectral data. And you can see that on this slide, for example, when you look at the R square here, so with the ongoing season, you see that actually the quality of the prediction is decreasing. Okay, so um, we need to tackle that. We need to be able to uh, have models that are able to predict properly across uh, the whole season. And <laughs> also one option to tackle that could be also to, um, to ask the farmer to provide some information. So to have a more tailored uh, service to the specific condition on the farm, for example, providing information on soil characteristic, floristic composition of the vegetation, uh, etc. Another interesting question was, um, what kind of information should we provide to the farmer? Are pasture characteristic averaged at the pasture level uh, interesting for the farmers, or is it interesting for the farmers to have a uh, pixel level information and so to be able to grasp some insights on the heterogeneity of um, of the paddock that um, he's actually or she is actually managing if you want to go to um, discuss the monitoring of the heterogeneity from the perspective of the animal grazing process then we are not sure that you can do that with satellite imagery because actually the size of the pixel is too big to be relevant and the revisit frequency of the satellite uh, is um, too low to be relevant uh, from uh, the, the functional uh, interaction between the animal and the vegetation. And so maybe to do that, that might be uh, dealt with by uh, drone imagery. And then we can think also of getting a little bit further. So uh, if we uh, if you are facing with complex multi-specific vegetation, as here it's, it, it's the, the pampa in southern Brazil, stems can represent a barrier to bite depth. Uh, and so bite mass is more related to uh, just uh, lamina or regrowth length than simply the swan height. And so working with this LIDAR or radar data to have information on the, the internal three-dimensional uh, structure of the vegetation uh, might be very interesting from a grazing management perspective, uh, in addition to the obvious horizontal distribution of, uh, of plants and the patches and heights. So if, uh, if we combine um, <coughs> multi-temporal drone-based or satellite imagery um, uh, with other types of tools, just like um, sensors that you discussed uh, before uh, uh, mentioning the work of uh, Lucille Riabov, uh, you can start thinking of enabling innovative grazing practices with a stocking method that would be able to uh, smartly use the heterogeneity uh, of uh, pastures that I think now you agree with that it's unescapable, the fact that we have heterogeneity and we can try to actually um, help us with these, that, that these methods can help us to actually properly manage this heterogeneity. Uh, one example of how that could be used was tested by our colleagues in Brazil. So um, they actually um, simulated um, how an accurate specialized monitoring of swan height uh, could help grazing management in always providing the animals with an ideal structure in terms of short-term integrate. And they did that with grazing sheep, but of course the concept can be applied to grazing cattle as well. So what they did is that the pasture was monitored to maintain swan height between 12 and 18 centimeters as grazing targets, which were identified for the species they were working on. And I guess it was um, Lolium multiflorum. Uh, Italian uh, Italian ryegrass. Um, 
So <laughs> these targets were identified as the ones that were maximizing the short-term interest of the animals. So when they identified areas with a paddock that was lower than 12 centimeters, that one was specifically deferred from grazing until monitoring indicated that the uh, regrowth reached uh, the right sward height again. Um, and when the uh, vegetation was higher than 18 centimeters, then a specific cut uh, was applied. And so if you start thinking of, um, of combining all these technologies, then you can dream, or maybe it's a nightmare to some of you, <laughs> but you can dream of uh, having more flexible uh, multi-sensor based grazing management that actually help you in providing a pastoral environment that is beneficial for your animals. That's the key point that we have to, uh, to think of. And that would be always the target that we should keep in our mind for uh, applying these technologies. And so just to let you uh, reflect a little bit on that. So I, I just found this interesting uh, image from, uh, I think it was made something like five years ago. It's a hype, a Gartner curves on all these technologies in um, in um, in agriculture, these uh, new technologies in agriculture. And I guess that when we look at satellite imagery, we are always we are getting close to a given maturity. But when we talk about um, deep learning, big data drones, we're still in the middle of the curve, in the peak of inflation or in the um, disillusion part of the curve. But I guess as scientists, we don't have to be very worried about that, but we need uh, our role is to clarify what can be actually expected from those technologies and what is uh, an, an, an exaggerated expectation of that. And more importantly, uh, to show to, um, to, um, to grazers how they can use this to have a more sustainable management of the pastoral ecosystem that is, I guess, so dear to all of us. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And I'm really sorry I overpassed my time a little bit, um, but um, I will be very happy to take the questions if you have some questions. Thank you, Jerome. Um, so if anyone would have questions, please put them in Maybe the Q&A box. sharing my screen. Let me just... So Jerome, I would have first question for you. Uh, in your opinion, how easily can the models be used in new regions or countries? Because from what you have uh, presented, sometimes you can get very accurate results for, for a predictive model in one site, but how do you see them? How can you transfer this knowledge to another region? So the question is, how the models that are developed in one region could be transferred to another region, right? That's yes. That's a, that, that's a key question. Uh, some people, um, I'm less familiar with uh, satellite imagery for that topic, but from drone images, some people showed that just by taking a couple, and by a couple, I mean more than 10 field measurements could help to kind of recalibrate the, um, uh, the algorithms that have been used to uh, uh, in another place to uh, be used to um, uh, to predict uh, the sward structure in, uh, in, in a new field. So I guess this is something, this is one way forward. And I guess another way forward would be to aggregate as much information as possible to be able to actually um, choose between maybe uh, key species in a, in a, in a paddock for example, let's say you have a ryegrass based paddock, then you say, okay, you take that. And then um, when you use um, prediction algorithm, those algorithms would actually be more adapted to the composition of the pasture that you are working on. Um, so I guess thinking of having one uh, algorithm that can go through everything is impossible. So we, we need to always keep that in mind. And a big effort should be made, I guess, to a standardizing um, uh, the way we acquire information and putting two databases together to be able to develop those more, I wouldn't say universal because they will never be universal, but uh, this universal database to have more uh, adapted, locally adapted uh, prediction algorithms and models. 
Yeah, thank you. So on the topic of the uh, data management, do you know how long is the data from the Sentinel uh, being kept or retained? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, no, I, I can't answer that question. Um, no, I, I prefer not to say something wrong. So I, the information is very easily accessible. And um, I mean, it's the European Space Agency. So uh, I suppose that on their website, they might provide you with this information. But we did, so we didn't, the, the information that we used had, uh, was, uh, had been acquired several years ago before we started this work. So I guess it should be a couple of years, but I don't know for how long. Thank you. I'm looking at, into the chat. We don't have any questions here for now, but I've got a question from Lucille. Uh, how do you plan to combine vegetation mapping with grazing behavior obtained from embedded sensors? Um, I think uh, if you plan to do that, you need to go, I would say to go through a, a, um, a, a grazing model. So a model that combines uh, uh, the um, so you need to uh, you need to use a model that will um, um, explain. I'm sorry because <laughs> I I think slowly today. So, so some kind of mechanistic grazing model where the where the animal is clearly identified in terms of behavior how that animal behaves in front of a vegetation of a specific structure, for example. So whether that animal will uh, graze at, this, uh, as a, at a specific rate, whether that animal will be selecting structure of a specific height instead of others. So through this kind of model, you can combine information from the vegetation that you measure through a drone or a satellite and the, the behavior of the animal. But I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to do that if you don't specialize the information on the vegetation, because the behavior of, of the animal and what you want to measure with sensors is actually um, uh, driven by the fact that the animal will change its behavior uh, um, because the, the, the grazing opportunities are changing on the vegetation. And so the animal will explore more uh, some parts of the paddock because that animal considers that this uh, this part of the paddock provides better grazing opportunities, etc. So um, very, it's very important to uh, to say that if you want to combine sensors uh, from data from sensors on animals uh, with uh, data acquired on the vegetation, that makes sense only if you do that um, if you specialize the information on the vegetation and you do that in a specialized uh, grazing model. Thank you very much. Um, I think in the interest of time, we will move to 